All right. Cool. All right, there are more people joining. Hi, I'm Mary Mertigliano. Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. The webinar will begin shortly. Um, uh, the editors, um, Diane Bell and Renata Klein, of a book called Radically Speaking, Feminism Reclaimed, will be discussing that book today. This series of webinars is run by radical feminists whose voices have been canceled or silenced in universities, schools, and media. Frustrated that we cannot share what we know in these places, we are offering this online series of webinars here. Um, Amparo, um, I think there's some biographical information on our, uh, on our editors. Um, yes, uh, today we have Diane Bell, a feminist anthropologist and social justice advocate. She's the author of some 10 books, including Daughters of the Dreaming and Nanjeri Borowarin, sorry for that, A World That Is, and Was and Will Be. She has held senior positions in higher education in Australia and in the USA. After 17 years in the USA, she left. Um, um, uh, sorry, she left uh, the USA when George Bush was re-elected, and eight uh, years in uh, South Africa working with Nanji Derry, and on eventually en environmental matters, she retired to Canberra, when she continues to write, plot, and plan, and imagine. A better world while being emerita professor at the Australian National University working on a new biography as the 2023 Hazel Rowley Literally Fellow and kayaking on the Mongolglo River. Renata Klein is a radical lesbian feminist and a biologist and social scientist who was associate professor of women's studies at Deakin University until 2006. She is co-author and co-editor of 15 books, among them Not That Yet, Feminism, Passion and Women's Liberation, 2021, edited with Susan Hawthorne, and Surrogacy, a Human Rights Violation, 2017. She has been an ardent critic of reproductive technologies, including surrogacy, since the 1980s. Renate is a founding member of FinRage, Feminist International Network of Resistance to Reproductive and Genetic Engineering, and an original signatory of Stop Surrogacy Now in 2015 and APSA, Stop Surrogacy Australia. She is also a member of ICASM, International Coalition for the Abolition of Surrogate Motherhood, France. Thank you both and welcome. Thank you very much, Marian and uh, Amparo, and nice to see some of you here. Um, so Diane and I will speak alternate, alternately um, about Radically Speaking and how it came into being. So um, I will start now. So hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you from the Jiru country, which is in the tropical far north of Queensland in Australia. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Over to you, Di. No, you're going to talk about how you met me. No, 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 that comes afterwards. You you do the um, <laughs> acknowledgement of country and then I say how. You script, Renata. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to all the, all the, for all the introductions and thanks for organising this session. Um, thanks, Amparo, and thanks, um, Marianne. Um, now let me begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal, traditional owners of the lands where I live, work and strategize. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and in particular, I honor their stories that are enduring signposts for an equitable future. Renata. Thank you, Diane. So now it's it's important how I met Diane Bell because it's actually quite a funny story. Um, and it was at the beginning of it all. So in 1986, I went to Australia from London, where I had been living doing my PhD, uh, as I had been awarded a fellowship to study women who went to IVF, in vitro fertilization. Um, my host was Deakin University, which I thought was in Melbourne, except it wasn't at that time. It was one hour out of Melbourne amongst a then deserted row of paddocks. 
So one day I sat in my office after five o'clock when everyone had left. It felt like a very dead building. I thought to myself, what have I done? How will I survive the next six months here? And then I heard this happy laughter. I went after the sound through the corridor and I found Professor Diane Bell, the first female professor at Deakin University. I didn't know that then sitting on her desk and laughing into her phone. And that was it. I think we went out for dinner that evening. So 37 years later, we are still friends, colleagues, and ardent joint tennis fans. <laughs> well, as Renata has spelled out, we met in 1986, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to look back across those 37 years of friendship, collegiality, crisis, and fun to that auspicious moment at Deakin University and to focus on radically speaking. It occupies a very special place in our relationship. It was, it was an urgent undertaking. It was a bold undertaking. It began with a series of conversations with exasperation, good humour and hard work. It was a collection of radical feminist voices distinguished by their continuity through time, global reach, politics of engagement, passionate determination to create a better world for women. We wanted to tell a story of a particular past, present and hopes for a future, one that concerns justice, dignity and above all safety from all forms of violence. We were concerned that radical feminist knowledge of the past had been misrepresented, had been misrepresented, fragmented and indeed abused in the retelling by others, such as liberal feminists, postmodernists, the right and the media. Our ability to act in the present was being severely curtailed by the postmodern insistence that there are no subjects. Envisaging a feminist future is rendered impossible when woman disappears. We introduced the book as a play, and this was its title, Beware, feminists, Radical Feminists Speak, Read, Write, Organise, Enjoy Life and Never Forget. In five acts with two speaking parts and an ever-increasing cast of characters who eventually get organised into thematic groups and begin to speak in prose. So here is our play in abbreviated form as published in 1996. So we're now starting with Act One, where radical feminists rant and rave about being attacked all the time by all manners of persons. We, we need a book. book. We need a book. Renata. I'm sick and tired of all rad of this radical feminist bashing. It seems we have become the target of postmodernists, the right, the media, and and the faux feminists who churn out one book after another, saying that radical feminism is the problem and that things aren't really that bad for women. And this preference for calling everything gender, gender feminist, gender studies anything to avoid putting men at the spot and using the word woman. And look at the media's attention they get when they say radical feminists are male bashers. To me, that's a real misuse of language. Women get assaulted, raped and murders, murdered. And when we speak out, we're called male bashers. Yes, a historical universalizing. Who is it that remembers? Who is it that makes global connections? I guess that is dangerous and needs to be put down too. Postmodernism, if I hear one more person expound her multiple subject positions, ah, radical feminists have always understood that race, class, sexuality and age are intertwined, but they hold fast to the identity of woman. That's absolutely crucial. It's the basis of political action. How can we speak if we are fragmented into so many partial and shifting identities? How can we engage in joint actions if we are merely, quote, sinking fragments? Isn't it interesting that just as woman began to speak in her own voice of her own realities, she was told that was naive. There was no unitary self. And now we move to act two, where radical feminists get to speak for themselves and a book is conceived. We do need a book that celebrates what women have achieved and has 
Confidence that there is a feminist future. I want a book about why postmodernism is bad for your health, about why radical feminists are such a threat. Okay, but let's be clear about what a healthy woman is. She is physically safe, economically secure, and is able to enjoy her human rights to the full. She might live in Bangladesh, in South Africa, in Russia, in Lebanon, in Chile, in Taiwan, the USA, Canada, Europe, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Aotearoa. She could live in the cities or the bush and don't assume she speaks English. She works, plays, study, raises children, lives alone, in families with other women, makes art, talks back, takes action. She is discriminated against, harassed, raped, the object of pornography. She bears the burden of caring for and feeding her loved ones, but is paid less than her male counterparts, if she's paid at all. This woman finds drinks with other women. They are her best friends, her support. She knows that despite the differences in personal background, geography, class, history and culture, she is vulnerable because she is a woman. Stubbornly, defiantly, we hold on to that truth. There is such a thing as woman. Remember Robin Morgan's uh, 1972 collection of poems, Monster, and her I Want a Woman's Movement Like a Lover? We need to listen to many women, working class women, lesbians, indigenous women, black women, women who took on the hard issues and have stayed with them. The brave prophetic voices of the late sixties and early seventies are still speaking. We need to hear them more than ever joined by new ones. Do you see the violence against women getting any less? No. We need to make it plain that radical feminism is global and that it is and always has been driven by issues, that the theory arises from the practice and that it is women of all classes, creeds, scholars and dispositions that are the basis of the movement. Remember the 1994 conference, Black Women in the Acad Academy Defending Our Name in Boston, a stunning statement about the involvement of women of color in the women's movement. And the sixth International Feminist Book Fair in Melbourne in July, 1994, celebrated indigenous, Asian and Pacific women's writing. It brought women together from around the world. As far as possible, the book should be international, inclusive and grounded in the actual experiences of real life women. It will tell a story. We'll have to interrogate postmodernism. Barbara Christian's The Race for Theory is a fabulous starting point. Soma Brodrib's Nothing Matters is already a classic. There's L.B. Smith's wonderful irreverent postcard from Ireland. Diane Richardson and Victoria Robertson's revealing account of the gender politics of publishing show how feminists are being marginalised. And it's all happened before. As Marcia Angelespi points out, women have, been sent against, women have been set against each other and the focus of serious research has shifted back to the male standpoint. Who is the focus of gender studies or lesbian and gay theory? Ask Sheila Jeffries that one. Or queer theory. Sue Wilkinson, Celia Kitzinger from the UK, Cali, call it a backlash. And what about postmodernism? It dislocates and fragments while claiming to create discursive spaces for a multitude of voices. But they are elitist and obscure in their language, and this reliance on French feminism is spurious. Christine Delphi from France is strong in, in her response, and Carol and Douglas puts it bluntly, quote, I'll take the low road and I'll be in Scotland, Peoria, Bangladesh, or any actual place before you. It's not that radical feminists are, quote, theory shy. It's just that we know a theory that is good in theory, but doesn't work in practice, is not much of a theory worth knowing. This book will be about crossing boundaries, about women taking control of their lives, refusing to buy the cheap, tawdry and sentimental depictions of their place, their, their or our place in society. It will have humor, 
compassion, dedication, hard work, and dangerous work. It will engage all generations. Here, Here goes, goes the proposal. proposal. That was us and together saying, Here goes yeah. the proposal. <laughs> 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 that's how it went you know the whole time when we did the book together we had a great time we did, and we didn't have zoom <laughs> oh we didn't have Zoom. we didn't have email actually that's right. so we had facts we're now in we're now into act three where during a rather extended pregnancy the manuscript grows larger and larger in June 92, we sent a letter to 28 colleagues, all women who had been involved in radical feminist campaigns over the years. Of this first group, some 20 stayed with us and appear in the present volume. We asked for suggestions of others we might involve in the project and the list grew. As the word spread that we're putting together a book on radical feminism and were serious about critiquing postmodernism feminists came to us with papers that might be appropriate we made lists of the themes we wanted to address and sought out new authors the book grew our publisher shuddered by now it was obvious the book had a life of its own this was no single issue, monolithic work. It was as diverse as radical feminism is. It refused to be constrained and it had an underlying coherence. All our contributors were committed to working for social change. As we read and communicated with each other, patterns emerged from the manuscript and we realized that this was what we wanted to tease our themes that would be reflections on the feminism we'd set out to document. Short, snappy, previously published pieces, we, which we called memorable me media moments, such as Sandra Coney's The Last Post for Feminism and Kathleen Barry's Deconstructing Deconstruction, would frame the sections and they would be typeset differently with a gray background so they stand out. While there are many expressions of radical feminism, a core is agreement that under patriarchy, women cannot be fully self-determining human beings and a commitment to transforming society so that women may enjoy their full personhood. Patriarchy assumes different forms under different conditions. It may be classism, sexism, racism, homophobia, and ageism. And it is the multiple intersection that we need to understand. Hence, radical feminist strategies have included law reform, speak out, sit-ins, and marches, the establishment of various centers for women. At first glance, the politics of the 90s appeared to be fertile ground for an inclusive, interdisciplinary, problem-based approach. Likewise, global communication networks seem to facilitate inclusive rather than piecemeal approaches. However, tracing interconnections and drawing macro maps were no longer fashionable activities for sophisticates. Rather, the fracturing of nation states, shrinking of budgets, growing specializations and subfields had spurred a return to the safe harbors of individual disciplines, exactly what women's studies did not want. To, accept, uh, to attempt to be a women's studies renaissance woman in the middle 90s was quite a task. Little wonder radical feminists who still tried and try to keep in touch with the many fields with whom we need to be conservant were and are called dinosaurs. Nothing has changed, the same is true today. However, in our view, we thought a radical feminist analysis was more pertinent than ever. Maybe that is why radical feminists are so feared. When our students set out to do independent research, it reflects their lives. They focus on sexual harassment and have already learned that the law alone will not protect them. Population control and genetic engineering are as eagerly researched as are the daily realities of female friendship and similarities between the second and the third waves of the women's movement. These young women are involved in women's organizations. They're working for change. 
through vigils, condom distribution on Valentine's Day, and this was on a Catholic campus, fundraising for lesbian centres, speak outs, marches and demonstrations. They continually emphasise the relationship between practice and theory. By now, we're up to mid-1995. Sigh, still at it. We print out the table of contents and we found we had 66 articles and 68 contributors. Anyone who thought that radical feminism was dead should think again. These were brave, witty, inclusive, incisive voices that spoke out of practice. They exude irreverence for boundaries, disciplinary and canonical, a willingness to tackle issues as they arise and to address them in all their specificity and messiness. The scholarship is rigorous and unrelenting in the recounting and accounting. For those who feel more comfortable with representations than real lives, such voices are shocking. Still, there's a playfulness with language, a well-honed sense of humour, as our, post, our POMO quiz, that's our postmodern quiz at the end of this presentation, demonstrates, with experimentation with style, poetry, fiction, photographs and metaphors. As the manuscript came into being, we wondered if there were any glaring omissions. Given the constraints of time, space and other people's workloads, we were happy with the range of issues we'd covered. More on work and health would have been welcome. On sexuality, we would have liked to add to the critiques with something positive, as Susan Hawthorne evokes in her Wild Politics and Robin Rowland addresses in her piece on radical, feminists, on radical feminist heterosexuality. And now we have made it to Act 4, but the hard part, giving birth, demonstrated that labouring internationally is worthwhile. Scene 1, speaking radically. March 1995 was our first opportunity to behold the entire, well, almost, manuscript, and the book was already a monster in the nicest possible Robin Morgan sense. Diane had flown in from the USA where an ice storm had ground most transport to a halt, and I had rescheduled my teaching for the week. Our only plan was to celebrate International Women's Day on 8 March by attending the launch of Zelda Daprano's autobiography in the afternoon, and then going to POW, the Performing Older Women's Circus, made up of women who ranged in age from 40 to 64 in the evening. The Melbourne weather was balmy. We went into retreat and began to work our way through the manuscript. The book had almost organized itself into sections. It was as if our contributors were engaged in a lively set of conversations. On the basis of the number of shared texts, we decided that a consolidated um, bibliography was in order. Um, but we did, however, decide to honor or honor with an uh, you or not a you and emphasize, emphasize with an S or a Z, the specificity of language by retaining the regional renditions of English spellings. That gets you uh, then reviewers saying, there are mistakes in this book, but they're not, they're there on purpose. For us, striking fe a striking feature of the radical voices in this collection is the diversity of their standpoints. From Angela Bowen in America, Nahuya de Avekotupu in Aotearoa and Joy James comes an insistence that we not sever our experience from our analysis, that we ground our theorizing in the lives of women from different communities. From Pat Marnie and Christine Smrocek, comes a fierce reminder that working class women have always been part of the women's liberation movement and that many are radical feminists. Education per se has not cut them off from their roots. Working class values still resonate. A corollary to the diversity of standpoints is that radical feminists are not single issue feminists. It would simplify our lives, not to mention our careers, if we were dealing in single issues, but we know from the 19th century struggles for suffrage and the US women's struggle to pass the ERA in the 1970s and 80s of the dangers of having all one's eggs in one basket. Women's history, as Joan Hoff points out, is a critical component of developing a consciousness about the ways in which knowledge has been politicized and women written out of historical scripts. 
Our contributors were well aware of the need to keep many fires burning. In fact, many could have written three or four pieces for us and still not exhausted their repertoire. Janice Raymond had written on women's friendships, reproductive technology, trafficking, and the politics of lesbianism. Angela Bowen works on biography, dance, and lesbian theory. Inez Talamantis, a poet, journal editor, teacher of Chicano Chicana studies, a, Na a Native American religion, and an environmental activist, protests injustice wherever it occurs. Noteworthy is a sizable proportion of our contributors are involved in establishing and running women's studies programs, as well as editing journals, newsletters, and book series. Radical feminists like radishes go to the root. When Louise Armstrong takes on therapy, she de-centers Freud. When Morni Joy identifies the radical questions in religion, she demands an ethical accounting from the patriarchs. Radical challenges to these cornerstones of patriarchy, law, religion, and medicine are rightly recognized as constituting a threat. A threat. And not surprisingly, there's a price to pay for naming the locus of oppression. The personal the personal is the political, perhaps the best known radical feminist slogan is, as Jocelyn Scott illustrates, a powerful analytic tool. It is at once both simple and complex, but it means just what it says. When Robin Morgan's collected poems, Monster, appeared in 1972, she demanded that Sylvia Plath's husband, Ted Hughes, be called to announce to account regarding his relationship with Sylvia. In explicit terms, she told the story of the destruction of a talented woman by an overwhelming male ego. Random House, the US publishers felt her poem, Arraignment, was quote unfair and quote libelous. And Robin Morgan was faced with the choice, rewrite or be silenced. Believing her collection constituted personal, political, aesthetic poems to be, quote, to be used as real tools slash weapons in the hands and hearts and mind of my sisters, end quote, she rewrote arraignment in a hypothetical, for, hypothetical form. Monster in the USA included this version, but feminists in Australia, Canada, and Great Britain prepared pirate pirate editions that included both, ver ver both versions. How can I accuse Ted Hughes, Robin Morgan asked. Two decades later in Yorkshire, a commemorate, as commemorated in Robin Rowland's poem, five feminists intent on remembering Plas chiseled the name of Hughes from her gravestone. It's a true story that one, you can go and have a look at um, the plate, except I think they have restored the name of use. So now we're into scene two, radical feminists under attack. The attack on radical feminism as both a theory and a praxis has continued since the first take back the night marches and collective theorize from experience. Diane Richardson asked whose interests are served by labels such as, quote, essentialism, quote, moralistic, quote, monolithic, and, quote, oversimplification. Given that for us, social change is the most important item on the political agenda, it is difficult to understand why we would hold on to a belief in essential, unchangeable selves as the basis of social order. Despite the attacks, radical feminists refuse to be silenced and instead of being intimidated, explore the dimensions of the strategies of silencing. This may entail a task as pragmatic as the archiving of our histories, as Jalna Hammer recounts in her article. Silencing may also be about threatening your job, dismissing your research as narrow-minded and unprofessional. How contemporary is all of that, isn't it? Uh, the insidiousness of such practices is that they are not about men versus women, but about the power of patriarchy to co-opt, silence, and make complicit about how whistleblowers become the troublemakers and are then identified as the problem. 
the classical reversal. The first response is to shoot the messenger and in so doing to deflect attention away from the substantial issues. The marvel is the wit and irony with, with which deep hurt and betrayals are confronted and recounted. So now we come to scene three, radical feminists interrogate postmodernism. It's a wonder, wonderful section. So what do our contributors have to say about postmodernism? The critiques of postmodernism are consistent. Whereas postmodernists occupied the borderlands lands, looking out over the wastelands created by their deconstructive brilliance, radical feminists have been busy crossing boundaries in order to integrate modes of understanding. The postmodern turn has depoliticized feminist theory. Postmodernism is self contradictory, as Christine Waters and Denise Thompson demonstrate. By declaring the end of truth, it actually makes a truth claim. Postmodernism is politically irresponsible, as Katya Milajovic shows with reference to violence against women. Sheila Jeffries argues that postmodernism disappears women with reference to lesbian and gay theory, and in the queer theory turn, lesbians are erased. Postmodernism relies on a, mo on, a, on a most partial, ahistorical, and decontextualized reading of high theory, mainly French, as Christine Delphi explains. Poststructuralism is, quote, a friend of phallic drift, writes Joan Hoft. And she explains, quote, like the tendency of a compass to drift north, no matter how you turn the instrument, Phallic drift is the powerful tendency to drift inexorably to the male point of view. So one of my most favorite statements. Or as I explained in my own article, postmodernism has dead bodies floating in cyberspace. Nothing's changed. Postmodernism represents women by difference not similarities, and the power of the representer is masked because it declines to identify domination in general and male domination in particular, postmodernism cannot contest the relation of power. On the surface, postmodernism is about making a discursive space available to quote the other. In fact, is it is elitist as Barbara Christian and Joy James demonstrate. And now we come to scene four, refusing to be silenced. Words may fly in the academy, but radical feminists refuse to be silenced. There is too much important work to be done. Take violence against women. Radical feminists have been talking about the various ways in which women are silenced, abused, coerced, exploited, and trafficked. They have documented these forms of violence from the local level to the international, but they haven't stopped there. Yen Ling Ku in Taiwan worked through grassroots organizations, the legislature and feminist publishing to create a safer world for women. Freedom and democracy do not necessarily mean a better world for women, as Diana Russell illustrates. Tatiana Mananova in the Commonwealth of Ind Independent States, as it was then, who has spent decades publishing the plight of Russian women now finds that changes in the geopolitical structures have facilitated an intensification of pornographic markets and prostitution. Telling a woman's story can be a revolutionary act, but under certain circumstances, so can silence. When Evelyn Ackard speaks out about genital mutilation, she raises the most difficult of questions regarding sensitivity to others, how to speak. Like other feminists caught in this cross-cultural dilemma, Evelyn chooses to name this form of violence against women. Like Marjorie Agassin, she is prepared to experiment with style. Through poetry and fiction, these women take us into their worlds. Agassin takes us into the Plaza de Mayo, where the mothers of the disappeared stand mute. Silence is a feminist strategy of protest. Finding a way of framing stories of horror such as those coming out of Croatia and Bosnia Herzegovina, in another is another example of feminist balancing tradition against human rights. 
making the argument that rape in war is a human rights crime and that what has happened in this region of Europe is genocidal femicide has required enormous courage. But silence in this instance would be complicity. Silence kills. How to speak and in what voice? Whisper, which is an acronym, when it stands for women hurt in systems of prostitution engaged in revolt makes anything but a small noise. Rather, Evelyn Jibo Bay's organization supports women quitting prostitution. And by now we have arrived at scene five, feminism reclaimed. From the very beginning of the second wave of the women's liberation movement, radical feminists have lobbied for, established and maintained women's health centers rape crisis centers, refugees, refuges, and a range of other collectives for women in the field of the art, science, law, and medicine. Radical feminists understand the need for, same, for safe same-sex places. Although involved in the immediacy of a particular uh, struggle, be it the daily demands of working in a rape crisis, center or a women's health center and scarcely able to draw breath, we write. Despite putting in the long grinding years of strategizing, fundraising, networking and petitioning that it takes to pull together an international coalition against trafficking in women, the International Feminist Book Fair, the Sisterhood is Global Institute or the Feminist International Network of Resistance to Reproductive and Genetic Engineering, that's FINRAGE, we write. Sometimes our writing um, issues in a declaration like that at Comilla in Bangladesh in 1989, where 61 women from 23 countries opposed population control. When radical feminists write, they are theorizing from practice. How do we speak cross difference? One thing is sure, radical feminists have refused to give in to despair. Manat Afkami, speaking from a Muslim perspective, holds out the hope that third world feminists can develop a sense of empathy with the Western sisters in other parts of the globe. Palfiri Rika Hike and Sigrid Markman write from in their cultures Maori and German, but do so in a common language. These complex undertakings demand finding ways of overcoming the stri strictures of the dominant culture while remaining faithful to one's own experience. Collaborative work requires dedication, but it can also be exciting as Cassie Dunsford, Beryl Fletcher and Susan Sayer demonstrate through their exchange about writing, editing and publishing in New Zealand. Cooperation rather than conflict, this is a radical thought. So where do we go from here? Susan Hawthorne's wild politics are inspirational, quote, let us not eradicate all meaning from the world, she writes. And further, quote, while politics is feminist and in keeping with the resistance of indigenous peoples, the poor and the marginalized, it resists Coca-Cola colonization and accumulation, overconsumption, fundamentalist and repressive ideologies, mass communications, the military and interference by international, scientific, monetary and cultural elites. While politics is a politics of joy. So in Melbourne, it was a wonderful International Women's Day. Zalda da Prano held us spellbound. We need a feminism with a heart, said this activist of three decades. The republication of her autobiography, Zelda, brought together feminists across the generation. Radical women celebrated radical women. Act five where our production schedule threatens to overwhelm us, but with the help of many, radically speaking, feminism reclaimed launches force. 
Somewhere in a course on publishing that neither of us has taken, it is probably explained that to bring an edited collection from idea to reality requires that we not exceed a certain number of contributors. It may also be explained that you need access to faxes, frequent flyer miles, and photocopies. A big fat ground would help too, as would a sabbatical. Radically speaking, certainly pushed the limits of our resources and time, and we could never have made it without the help of many, many good women and several key institutions. We had no ground, but we did grab every possible opportunity to create working spaces for our book and to have fun, why, which is why we added the promo quiz. Responding to our requests for multi-choice questions that might assist the reader in working through the complexities of postmodernism, we received many items. We regretted that we could not publish them all. Some were funny, but not true. Others funny and true. Many were libelists and still others employed language that was not in our spell check, let alone our vocabularies. Here's a sampling, and we invite you to make up your own. Question. How many POMOs does it take to change a light bulb? A, none, because the light bulb, which both typifies the weary technological inventedness of a dead modernism and also serves as an iconic representation of modern thought, quote, idea, is entirely meaningless in a postmodern world. B, none. They wouldn't bother. It's essentialist and ahistorical to think that you can't see in the dark. C, none. The Enlightenment is dead. I still have to laugh. <laughs> Essentialism <laughs> is wrong because A, it's wrong. B, the truth is it's not true. C, it's a moral evil. D, postmodernists post say so. E. There aren't any reasons. F, it's not wrong at all if you call it ontology. Question, if POMOs extol the virtues of multivocality, how come they don't want to hear what radical feminists have to say? A, they are deaf, textually speaking. B, they are in denial. C, they are frightened. D, they wouldn't know the truth if they saw it. Question. If Foucault is right and power is everywhere, why do we all have to pay electricity bills? Question, if the prick is a god and god doesn't exist, then, then does Pomo philosophy exist? A, ask Derrida. B, ask Foucault. C, ask the South. Yes, he's dead. D, no. Question, when booking an airline ticket, which of a person's multiple subject positions travel first class? Question, if the author is dead, who gets the royalty check? A, the tax bed. B, ducks. That was always Renata's preference. C, <laughs> checks, <laughs> checks are text, stupid. <laughs> Question, are POMOs universally anti-environment? A, yes. Ask the trees which have been pulped. B, the land is for inscription, not for conservation. C, no, because the environment does not exist. Question, if there are only texts, what does it mean when the FBI reports a 120% increase in violent crimes against women between 1993 and 1994? Question, why does Derrida call women the quote name for that untruths of truths. A, he has a problem knowing what truth is. B, he hates his mother. C, he hates his sister. D, he hates himself. E, he needs therapy. Question, if there is no such thing as truth, why can you be inca incarcerated for perjury? A, because judges have not read Foucault. B, because jail is just a text. C, because you deserve it. And question, what is phallic drift? A powerful subterranean force capable of moving continents. B, a wandering dick. 
C, a pen which is in motion. D, the powerful tendency for public discussions of gender issues to drift inexorably back to the male point of view. So Diane and I had great fun compiling the POMO quiz with the help of the contributors. And we do it all over again. But interestingly, and a bit unexpectedly, it divided our readers, even radical feminists. Some loved it and thought it was hilarious. Others felt that it was going too far. But since this is the title of a much loved book by Robin Morgan, Going Too Far, the criticism did not cause us sleepless nights. So, and now finally, I hope you're still awake. We have made it to the curtain call. Our collaborate, the book is born. Ta -da -da -da. Our ah. collaboration <laughs> was a joy. Especially pleasant has been discovering how easily we can write together. And radically speaking, was not supposed to be our last word on the subject of radical feminism. At the time, we planned to produce a companion volume. Uh, named Essential Readings, which is really loved Essential Readings, a source book, which would contain many of the classic writings of radical feminists. And we would have been able to republish pieces by authors already in radically speaking. But then came Barbara Crow's 2000 excellent book, Radical Feminism, a Documentary Reader, a collection of classic texts that feminists needed. The timing was perfect. Essential readings became redundant. A great pity for the brilliant blue cover we would have used as on Radically Speaking. Beautiful wives repeating the endless cycle over and over. The best thing about editing Radically Speaking was the opportunity to work with Diane, whose generosity of spirit awesome intellect and great sense of humor made hard work pleasurable. I did learn, however, that she too has a weakness to not disturb her files. But even when I did, she still cooked fabulous meals. Renata's easy to cook for. She'll eat black bean soup night after night and declare it great. I learned a lot from her and that multitasking is real. Renata can work on several demanding projects in parallel and not lose focus. She has colleagues across the globe, is fluent in many languages, but not sadly in Australian rhyming slang. Still Editing... <laughs> we made a list. Uh, editing with Renata went from elaborate to simple. We started by sitting at either end of my large dining table in Massachusetts, read the same articles, marked them up, then compared notes. After about three or four pieces, we found our notes were so similar we could dispense with a double handling. And then, last word, there is the award-winning Spinifex Press, without whom radical, radically speaking would never have been conceived, let alone reached voting age. Spinifex was and remains fiercely independent, innovative, and unlike most publishers, maintains a backlist. Radical feminism. And the quorum, radical feminism has a past, uh -huh. a, a present, and, and a future. A future. And that is the end. So um, in order to buy the book, you can, of course, go to any bookshop, but you can also order it from the Spinifex Press website. And uh, the flyer that was shown in the middle will probably be shown again shows where you can buy it if you are in the US, Canada or in England, Europe. Now um, it is 7.49 my well we're in the evening of course. Um, are there any questions? Hello is anybody there? That's probably where Amparo or Marion comes back. Or Sheila? Um, well, uh, there were many, many comments on the on the chat, not technically questions for you, but they were they were enjoying so much this presentation. Someone said we should be a paying audience to this delivery. So congratulations <laughs> on the presentation. 
And, uh, and now we have, uh, we have a question. Uh, let, let me check uh, how to, uh, because someone raised uh, their hand. Let me check. So uh, can you write, uh, please, anyone having a question? There's the section Q&A at the bottom of your screen on your uh, Zoom, uh, either on your on your phone or on your um, desktop. So uh, Renate and Diane will uh, very kindly answer your, your queries about the book. Um, some of the questions were about where to buy the book. Um, and uh, as, as you say, it's here in the in the flyer at the bottom of the of the screen. Um, for Australia and New Zealand, directly to spin effects, and there are um, other resellers in North America and United Kingdom and, and, and Europe. And there is also an ebook. So if you want it straight away, go to spin effects and you can download it immediately. Okay. There's a question now for you from Angela Wild. Um, the attacks Rathfem face are still very much current, having gone away. Are, we are often uh, demonized still. Um, so uh, she asks, any plans to make a radically speaking of 2023? Hi, Angela. Well, you know, I don't know if you've read, read the book or maybe you read it a long time ago. It's actually incredibly current. It really is incredibly current. And I... When I reread, I haven't read the whole book because it's is six <clears throat> But when I reread some of it, I mean, it is so current, and the, of course, the threat of postmodernism is still here. But of course, we now have the transgender cult, and you could um, exchange postmodernism a few times for that, and it, it says exactly uh, the, what the problems are today. So. I don't think I would have it in me again to do this work. I don't know how Diane feels about this, but it was an incredible amount of work um, because we really, really, really made a very big <coughs> effort to find authors uh, that we didn't just have at our fingertips, but um, you know that were in countries that it was quite difficult to find them. And if we did, uh, radically speaking, 2023, uh, we will obviously have to do the same. It might be easier today with email, but actually I think the wonderful thing about this book is that it speaks for itself. I mean, maybe when we reprint at some point, Diane and I can write a new introduction. That's a possibility. What do you think, Di? We could write another play. <laughs> we can write another play. Maybe that's much easier. Let's write the play on radical feminism and then perform it at yeah. Philia or yeah. somewhere. That would be good. Yeah, that could be fun. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the things, Renata, I'm not sure we made quite enough of was just how hard the editing was. That there was, so, we, we were quite clear between ourselves in terms of what had to be shortened and where a thread had been lost in a, an article. Um, but there were some authors who'd never really been edited. And I think that's um, a tendency that's getting to be more and more widespread because we don't have copy editors anymore. We don't have thematic editors anymore. Uh, publishers don't employ editors anymore. Um, oh, and I no, one, or, one, or, one author, one um, author who will go nameless, um, who we started off with something like 50 pages and I got it down to 12. And she was sent, she'd, never ever been edited like that and accepted it do you remember yeah i do i do remember and she shall remain uh nameless yeah. and um, it's brilliant that you did that and they, they couldn't have put 50 pages in but the 12 pages that there are now in are very very good yeah um, and then there was the, then there was the article that you tracked down all the references for do you remember um oh, in the british oh. library because it was a, a series of claims uh, which yep. we both felt had to be substantiated. So this was without email, without digital media. Um, you went into the library and found the references. That kind of hard work was really telling. Yeah. Yeah, and that would be easier today. I mean, that would be yeah, much easier. But actually, 
because we, uh, as we said in when we were speaking, because we made one bibliography for the whole book, it's absolutely fantastic. I sometimes really use it when I'm too lazy to go look for a book or even look it up on the internet. I just look it up in Radically Speaking. Um, I mean, you know, it's a fantastic book. I mean, we should be very, very proud uh, of that. And I often say, I mean, it's very hard, like, you know, people say, and what's the best book that Spinifex ever has published? And of course, there's so many, many great books that we published. We were just talking about this today, Susan and I. Uh, it would be very hard to even say this or that, but clearly, radically speaking, you know, really ranks amongst the best of our books. At least I feel like that. But then, of course, they're all of Di Diane's books, so I should mention, we should mention them too. We have five minutes left, and uh, Sheila Jeffries has uh, also a question. So, uh, Sheila? Yes. Hi, folks. Um, I, I, I love that, as I love the book. Um, and I, can I say that I love being edited by Spinifex? I mean, it's so lovely <laughs> to feel that someone actually reads what you write and has a reaction to it. I mean, <laughs> academic publishers never, ever have any kind of reaction. You feel you're writing into a complete void. So it's lovely oh. being edited by Spinifex. Uh, but apart from that, when, when you were talking, I was so aware of everything that existed for feminists. Even then, I know 1996, you know, we were under threat. Uh, radical feminism was under threat. Postmodernism was out there. I just wonder how long you feel any kind of proper feminist movement, such as we would understand, lasted. Because 96, it was still there, but under threat. What do you think? What do you think the sort of significant points at which we can say we pretty much lost? Oh, that's very difficult. We lost it in the universities. Yes. We lost it in women's studies. Yes. And that was by, by the early 2000s, pretty much, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah was still I mean, and it, there's a resurgent in some areas. Um, you know, there are young women who are rediscovering that you can't just, you know, um, social media yourself into a better world, uh, that there needs to be organisation, there needs to be networks, there needs to be some kind of deep understanding of the, the structures that create these inequalities. Um, I think the word patriarchy is coming back into use uh, with meaning. Um I always preferred male domination, but yes, that's good. I don't like male domination, Sheila. <laughs> you know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> of course I do. But I'm I just... actually, yeah, I think I agree with all of that. But I think, unfortunately, very sadly, I think women's studies we have lost. I can't see young women actually, well, it's not really the young women, I can't see the universities ever, well, should never say ever, but getting back to it um, in the near future. They are also at the moment embroiled in uh, cancel culture and not making the wrong moves and not being able to say that. It's good. There are also, you know, more and more people speaking out against that. So it will take more, it will take time and we will come back. The other thing I was thinking, I mean, when we did Radically Speaking, we really did feel on the great attack by the various postmodernists. And in fact, the section in the book, um, critiquing postmodernism is one of the best and it has over 10 articles in it it's fantastic mm -hmm. but from memory i really did think I, I think we really did think that this was an extraordinary attack and it was and i don't know i mean i didn't ever feel like oh we were gonna go under or you know it was the end of radical feminists feminism and feminists as we knew them um, but I think it should give us hope because we did survive. Radical feminism is still here. Radical oh, feminism is. definitely has had a resurgence, um, more so in some countries than in others. Um, so it's also, the book is also kind of like, has a, a bit of a beacon of hope that we do get through bad times and the time will come when somebody will write a book and say, why on earth from 2000 and let's say 13 onwards, uh, did we have this total, you know, insane, inane 
movement, the trans cult, why, uh, what, what, what were people thinking? And I am sure we will get to that point and hopefully a lot of us will still be alive. I'd like to see that. We're um, about out of time. Um, I'm just scanning, I'm just scanning down the chat. Um, and I see a number of my friends and colleagues from South Australia are there. A big shout out, and I'm coming back to do some work there. Um, I just wanted to make that shout out because in the intro, it was said that I was working in South Africa, and that's from the initials SA, which actually stand for South Australia. So mm. much I have done some work in South Africa, but my current work is in South Australia. So see you there. Thank you all for being here. We were 150 women here this morning. Oh, um, great. And we will uh, see you next week. Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. And bye-bye to all of you. Bye. Bye-bye.